Hey everybody, welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum, Kids Independent Media Production. Today, we are diving deep on the concept of ergonomics as it relates to the angles of everything on your kit. Now, a while back, we did sort of the scientific approach to this with a leveling app in the phone and learning about the specific angles that we were using in order to get the setup that we were using at the time. Today, we're coming at it from a completely different angle, which is let's explore some different setups that we've either seen people using professionally or that we've come across in the course of our learning how to play and finding our sound that might be useful to you out there as you start to develop your technique further and discover exactly how you want to be hitting your drums. Now, the number one thing that we're looking at here is the angle of attack, because as we change the angle of the drums, our body movements, when we connect with them with the sticks, is going to change. And that means that the angle of the snare, the ride cymbal, the toms, all of these things are going to change how we have to move to get the optimal strike on each of the instruments. We also need to say that nothing we're doing today is about right and wrong. This is strictly about ergonomics, preventing injury, making playing easier, making getting the sound you want easier, possibly even extending the life of the heads or the symbols that you're using. It's all in furtherance of what's best for you. This has nothing whatsoever to do with anybody on high saying that this is the right way and that's the wrong way. It's really whatever works for you. First up, and frankly the one that I'm most excited about because I have never really set my drums up this way, is tipping everything toward us in the spirit of 80s metal and rock bands back in the day with giant bass drums and power toms and frankly having to tip them forward just because of the size of everything. Now granted, we don't have an 80s Metallica kit here. Dave Lombardo is not in the building. This is not as extreme as a lot of things that you might have seen back in the day when at least I was a kid. But the spirit of this is coming from this place of arena rock, of big sounds, big spectacle, and frankly, power toms and 24 inch bass drums, very prevalent in the 80s into the 90s in some cases. And in furtherance of being able to hit these things at all, we can't have them vertical because the bass drums are so big, even if it's on a rack. So this precipitated a scenario where everything is tilted toward the drummer for ease of access, ease of power, and again, getting a good strike on the instrument so the tone really speaks. Secondary to this, and even more personal, is that a lot of these guys were sitting pretty low back in the day. It was just part of the style. It's what a lot of players were doing. So this gets us even further, closer to the ground, away from these drums that are way high up in the air, necessitating it getting tipped even further. I'm thinking now about Iron Maiden and some bands where they're almost pointed directly at the drummer. And at the end of the day, it looked amazing and totally bananas as a spectator, but also there was a playing reason for putting them in these positions. Now, on the other hand, we could also talk about players of shorter stature who want to use full-size drums, not necessarily a 24, but just average-sized drums who are going to run into issues just by virtue of their personal size and how they need to access the instruments. So again, getting away from maybe mounting the tom off the bass drum, putting it on a snare stand, or starting to utilize a rack or something like that to give you more options and not be stuck with what the dimensions of the instruments are offering you can actually be a great way to access for the smaller player larger drums, larger sounds, all of that. Now for door number two, the very, very flat setup a la pop punk 90s, 2000s.
Now, I know I said before that I never really set my drums tip toward myself. I've actually never done this either, and this is proving to be super fun and something that I might start doing in my actual playing life because even as a traditional grip player, having the drums low and having the drums flat is actually really nice for me. I can get a good attack on them. I can get a nice flat connect with all of the heads, I'm not having to worry about denting them up or hitting them at an oblique angle that's going to create tears or anything like that if I'm really digging in. This is really, really fun. Now, this is also a visual spectacle from a certain time, no different than the last one we were talking about, but kind of a different character. It's a, it's representing different music. Every era and every genre has directions that they go for how they want their style to look, overarching many of the bands. If you ever went to the Warp Tour, I'm sure you saw a drum set set up like this at least once. And there are merits to this. A super flat setup, to me, means that rim shots are very possible. It means that swinging very hard and having a physically lower connect with the drums makes for a very different playing experience. And also, if you want to raise your cymbals up in the air, it means you can get an even bigger differential between them. So if you need to be swinging really hard and not have your hands run into each other, there's lots of room to move in a setup like this. This also affords us a very level plane for all of the drums. We have the rock tom almost as low as the snare drum, and I've seen other players do this too. Some of JoJo Mayer's setups have been a very level playing field across the board, or anyone we might have seen that was completely eschewing the rack tom and just playing more of like a flat lateral set like this. It becomes a very different orchestration experience to be playing with everything like this and not moving through these vertical planes to access different parts of the kit. This is also starting to be more comfortable for me as a traditional grip player because having a snare tip toward me is going to make me bend my wrist at a very oblique angle. We're going to talk more about that later, but suffice to say, having it tip toward me is pretty uncomfortable to play as a traditional grip player. And there's a fair amount of footage from the 80s and even the 90s of some of our favorite very chops heavy traditional grip players playing with their snare angled like this. And I, I mean, you watch their wrists and it, it looks like it's really uncomfortable. And finally, today's elephant in the room, everything actually tipped away. Definitely the most hypermodern, probably the most contentious if you've just seen it but never actually set your drums up this way. I really didn't know what we were getting into when we started to do this, and I was shocked at how ergonomic it turned out to be as a traditional grip player. And honestly, it didn't really feel that weird at all. Now, interestingly enough, the guys that I know that play with a setup that is to some degree tipped away are not all traditional grip players. In fact, only a couple of them are. This has more to do with what's comfortable for them and what feels good when they're playing time, when they're playing fills, and when they need to get around the kit easily. Now, what's interesting about this is the drums themselves are not physically lower than they were before, but because the angle of attack is tipped away, they actually feel like they're lower to the ground than either of the previous two setups, which is another part of the, the psychological ergonomics of a setup like this. For me as a traditional grip player, going between a snare tilted this way and a floor tom tilted this way feels super duper easy and also feels a little bit more powerful because the strike is at the very end of my motion rather than kind of halfway through. This again is all just player's choice. There's no right or wrong here, but for me, I had an easy time playing this setup and the way that the articulation felt and the way that the power of the stroke felt was significantly different than the other two setups. The bottom line here with all three of these is trying them out is where it's at. And like a lot of our setup ideas that we go through here, the cool thing is you don't have to buy anything. This is just about changing some angles, sitting down, playing, seeing if it inspires you, seeing if you totally hate it. And then what can we integrate? Maybe leave the tom like this and then tip the floor tom away. You can do whatever you want.
we don't often bring up symbols in terms of the sound and the playing of them on here because we have the symbol series over on our Patreon. And if you want to follow the link below, you can check out all of that. It has grown exponentially and there's a lot of information over there. But that said, we're going to touch on it today because moving to the symbols, this angle of attack business starts to be a much bigger sound production issue than it is with the toms and the snare. The angle at which you hit your cymbals or your hi-hats, which are also cymbals, really affects the sound of them and the angle at which a player puts them has a lot to do with how they want to use that cymbal, what sounds or parts of it they want to access, and frankly, even if they just don't care about hitting the bell, because honestly, not everybody does. Now, we mounted up an X-hat just to talk about how, depending on what kind of sound we want out of it, we might choose a different angle, starting with very tight as a more of electronic dry sound where I only want to hit the flat on top. Or then loosening it up a little bit, thinking about a washier, more traditional kind of rock hi-hat sound where I'm going to definitely only be playing on the edge. And lastly, if I want to have a more open kind of washy sound and just use it for accents, I can open it up further, but then tip it away so that I have a difficult time accidentally accessing those other two sounds. In addition to making it very consistent by tipping it away, it also means that if I want that edge sound, I don't have to change my body mechanics to get at it when it's way down there. By tipping the edge up, it's easy access and I don't have to change any of my motions at all. Moving on to the ride cymbal, whether you play jazz, rock, punk, whatever it is, each of these styles has a kind of like, that's usually what people do sort of thing in it about how they set up their ride cymbal. But let's get away from that. Let's talk about how we want to use the ride cymbal. We have crashing it, we have playing on the bow, we have the bell. What do we need to access? What do we need from it? This could go for crash cymbals too. Let's start with tipped quite a bit toward me in what I would consider to be a jazz fashion. This is great for playing with the tip of the stick at a lot of angles. The bell access is super easy. I can crash it with the shank of the stick, but if I want to really crash the edge, I might have to get up on top of it or get to the side so it has access to some things, limitations in others. Next up, slight angle toward me, more of a standard pop or rock angle. I can get at everything with this, it feels pretty versatile. I could do jazz with this, it's all good. Now, super duper flat. <laughs> I remember a long time ago setting up some very flat crash cymbals and having somebody say to me, you must be a rock drummer because you have your cymbal set up flat. Well, that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is I mostly just want to hit the edge of that particular cymbal. So why would I worry about tipping it toward me and then have to lean at a funny angle to get it? I can still access the flat of the cymbal and I can still play the bell, but now we're starting to get into a realm where I would think of it as primarily for crashing. And now the most extreme, we're going to tip it away from us. Now seeing this on the internet took me a second to get used to, but once I started experimenting with it, I realized that there were some merits here. The primary one is that A, like the X hat before, I have easy access to the edge and I don't have to lean over if I want to get a full crash sound. I can just reach and open it all the way up. But secondarily, I can also crash ride the cymbal with very gentle dynamics because 
it's just a comfortable angle to play right on the edge. And that's something that is useful in an awful lot of situations, especially if you play a lot of styles and also play in a lot of different rooms and have to be thinking about generating a certain kind of energy stylistically without always overwhelming the band because you have to bash the thing to get it to open up. All of these things together, again, like most things we talk about here, are about making life easier for us as drummers and also for giving us quick, fast access to the sounds that we need so that we can have as few roadblocks as possible between us and making the music exactly how we want to make it. Now, finally, we do want to touch on the snare drum alone, and this is maybe the most personal part of the drum set for me when I sit down. The angle of the snare really defines how my gig is gonna go. Now that's not just because I play traditional grip most of the time. I think this is true for a lot of drummers because we need a lot out of the snare drum on the average gig. There's a lot of sounds in there. There's a lot of consistency that we need to have access to and a lot of dynamics in order to move through all the different songs you might have to play in a set. Now example number one, dead flat. Perfect for matched grip, can be a little bit tricky for traditional grip depending on how you hold the stick if you are a palm up traditional player versus a handshake, I'll call it traditional player. This one's a little bit trickier to get that low. If you're more of a palm up, it's really not too bad at all. Lots of my friends play that way. Number two, tipping the drum straight away from us, a la one of the kit setups earlier. Now, depending on how high you raise the drum, this can be usable for matched or traditional. It's a little more comfy for palm to the side, handshake traditional in this case. But, you know, nothing wrong with that at all. It's pretty comfy for me. I've done it before. It's good enough for Keith Carlock. It's good enough for me. I particularly love this angle for situations where I need to involve rim shots inside of quieter things like a shuffle or a James Brown funky drummer kind of grooves because it brings the rim closer to the stick in the relaxed traditional grip position. And for me, it, it makes playing fast shuffles or anything that's busy and dynamic in the left hand a whole lot easier. And finally, extremely tipped to the right. This to me is indicative of almost like a field drum or a drum that would be slung to the side, which is the origin of traditional grip in the first place. So it feels pretty natural to play tradish on this. There's a handful of really great drummers that like a very extreme to the right angle. I love them very much. It's a little much for me, not so much because of the left hand, but because I have to come in at more of an oblique angle from the right hand and I prefer to go up and down. So this is perfect indication of how personal this is and it's really worth trying all these things out no matter what grip you play because even if it's something unusual you may discover that you like an oblique angle for playing matched or you like it dead flat for traditional personal 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 check them all out so what we're asking of you today is to take something in your setup Swing it in an extreme direction. See how it makes you feel. Don't be afraid if it feels terrible or if it initially feels terrible and grows on you. These things are all in furtherance of inspiration, getting a good sound, and making sure that we stick to this idea of starting with a hypothesis and looking for evidence rather than being conspiratorial and starting with the end game and trying to work our way back with only evidence that supports our final conclusion. And as always, please like, comment, subscribe, and follow the link below to our Patreon, where there will be more footage from almost every episode we ever did, and a lot more about symbols, which we touched on a little bit today, but most of that's over there.